So my name is Raimundo Tonatiu Reynoso. Uh, I'm also known as I1. I'm an LA-based artist and designer. I think I'm still hung up on the fact that I emigrated here, so I have a little bit of um, like Mexico City, like chaotic, like city life in my head. And I feel like LA is a bit more relaxed than that. So one of the things that I look for in LA is sort of that chaos and like that craziness and like the aesthetics of the streets, um, the aesthetics of like a super multi-ethnic city. Probably as far as places I've been, probably the most multi-ethnic city. So you see all kinds of things that probably are hard to see in one place anywhere else. Um, the aesthetic I look for in LA is probably just that craziness of a city. Uh, I think as an early kid, probably influenced a lot by the aesthetic of Blade Runner and how much it kind of does look like that, unless you're like at the beach or somewhere really, really suburban. But if you're in the city part of LA, it kind of fits. My practice is a bit schizophrenic because I do graphic design as a job, like nine to five. Um, and my studio practice is really heavily geared towards documenting, documenting that same chaos and the same, you know, just multitude of experiences that we live in and that we see here in LA. So it starts off basically with photography and I do that mostly when I'm painting graffiti. Um, I also bike a lot and walk a lot. So that's how I capture different parts of the city from that. My approach is in my head conceptually, like I'm creating like an imaginary image for a flyer. So a lot of my work is really high contrast, black and white. Um, and I like to, I do bounce back and forth, like with, uh, you know, in the computer and out of the computer. Sometimes I edit my photos a little bit. If there's something in the background that I don't want, like a big McDonald's sign, or maybe if I do want it, I'll leave it in. But it's mostly documentary, it's just stuff I see. I was really attracted to that at a really early age and I like the fact that it's very, um, it's very available to just about anyone, or it was, where you can just like make an image and make multitudes of it, multiply it and put it out there. Like I collected flyers as like a way to collect imagery for free. Um, then I got like the first like really serious batch of design work I did were punk rock flyers and I would actually use other people's photographs and images for that. Um, so I hit a point where I was like I really like that aesthetic but I want to use my own imagery. I don't want to like just be like pilfering unless I really need to for some specific reason. Um, so that's I think that's like the most direct line from like that beginning into graphic design to through to my like fine art practice and I'm really really into printmaking so I feel like xeroxing photocopying silk screening are like modern you know it's like like contemporary ways to print make I think maybe I'm I was I'm just kind of I don't know if it's hyper is the word but it's just like I like I, so now looking back, I think um, like the biggest split that I see in the work I do, I'd say there's three. There's like graphic design, like in the, you know, in the traditional sense where I, like I'm designing something for a purpose for mostly someone or myself or like some combo of the two, like where I have to design, you know, a publication or design a record cover or something like that. Um, my graffiti is also. I think informed a lot of what I do because a lot of my photography comes from stuff I shoot when I'm painting walls. But that to me like is sort of like clearly separate from my fine art practice where it's just like colorful graffiti with a lot of like characters like that are based on cartoons. Um, so it kind of fits just within the general idea of what people think of as graffiti. Um, and then, yeah, like my studio practice is more, I think, introspective, but at the same time, it's more like addressing like the issues that like I live in and that we live in in LA. 
so I think all of that just comes from just being into all kinds of things growing up. You know, I like I love design. I love comic books. I loved rip, like punk rock records, uh, like robot cartoons. So all of that just kind of blended in as I was growing up. But I've kind of managed to keep like three lines kind of not separate, but they're distinctive. If you look at like my graffiti and then you look at like one of my like pieces in a museum, like you won't necessarily know it's the same the same person that did them but I kind of I kind of like that and especially with like graffiti being like almost like a covert or secret identity or a parallel identity like it kind of works so that it's not the same thing and I also never felt comfortable just taking what I do on a wall and like miniaturizing it onto a canvas and just painting the same thing So my history of publishing started again through punk rock and hardcore. Um, I would see zines and come across that kind of thing at shows and I just immediately wanted to do one myself. And I thought that's what was one of the biggest lessons and one of the biggest inspirations from that being involved in that subculture that you can figure out what's within your means and just try to make something. So the first zine I, I made was just like one copy where I just drew it all out by hand, like try to trace the fonts or write out the stuff and then just started to use like letter set or like sticky letters or photocopying stuff, collaging it. The, um, I figured out how to paginate just by like making a mock-up just like or tearing apart a comic and saying like, hey, like, Page one is in page two is it you know like just figuring that out it's just very hands on and I think I got that out from punk like I was like oh cool like I can do this um, I connected it with graffiti through uh, Temp who's like a very like like a very influential Los Angeles graffiti writer and he gave me a bunch of graffiti zines that were made the same way punk rock zines were made and I was like whoa like you can do zines about anything you want so I started doing a graffiti zine called Lost and that was the first one was like just photocopied I got a job at a like at a like digital slash rotary press place and I was um, I became like the director of the graphic design department for the digital end of it and I had like just all out access to everything all their all their copiers or printers um, we even like the the guy who ran the press, press, offset press, like would lean on us for film or that kind of thing. So we'd kind of trade and be like, hey, can you print this on your press? So I started combining that. And yeah, it was all self-publishing. From that, I got hired to art direct a music magazine called Herb, here, based here in LA, that I had looked up to as a kid because it was also a DIY publication, more based on like the techno and house scene in LA. Uh, when they started to kind of transition to other types of music, they're trying to change the look of the magazine and they hired me to direct it and kind of redesign it and like go along with um, or coincide with their like change in like editorial direction where they were more open to other kinds of music. So it was, for me, it was still kind of like the roots of like doing or being involved with zines about hardcore and punk like still kind of applied. It's a lot, a lot more refined. Uh, from that magazine, I designed other publications for Scion, for Toyota, which was their, like, we are one of their marketing accounts. So we would do a lot of the urban, the urban marketing part of their, of their Scion line. So we would do a magazine called Scion. That was, a, that was also like a regular publication. Uh, from there, I just started to like really be picky and now mostly do my own scenes. I've done a couple books like where I'll, I did the most recent book I did was with a Cuban photographer, Perfecto Romero. So I did a book that coincided with an exhibit that he's been kind of touring. So yeah, that's publishing. But mostly I would say besides like the corporate part, like when I was doing Urban Toyota Scion was just like all like DIY, like mostly self-directed independent publishing. The curatorial practice almost started out from necessity because, and it's actually interesting that we're here in the studio because the the artist who had the studio before, this uh, artist named Man One, had a gallery down the street uh, called Crew West, 
and that gallery was the first gallery in LA that like specifically showed like you know graffiti artists people with that background uh, like way before anyone even thought of that as like art you could show in a gallery and he asked me to do a launch for my zine lost like for one of the issues that I did so I figured if I'm doing like a presentation of the publication like why can't why it why wouldn't it make sense to have artists from the publication on the walls of the gallery and that began me curating a series of exhibits that coincided with lost so I did a, uh, I believe like five like that corresponded with each issue um, and I really I think I see it almost I'm designing on walls and working with images so I'll be I'll basically like do a layout like virtually or digitally of exhibits and I really like that it, like to me I really like like it's the same as if I was laying out a page uh, so I enjoyed it and I guess it just kind of snowballed like I started getting more opportunities to curate um, the latest curatorial project I did was for the Getty Research Institute and they uh, approached myself and a group of five other artists to curate a collection of work from the greater Los Angeles like graffiti community we ended up getting about 170 artists and made a book uh, with the Getty for, you know, that comp compiled all of that. And then that became a curatorial project at El Segundo Museum of Art, where it was the same approach where we each curated a group of artists to produce a mural. Um, yeah, so that, that's probably like the, the biggest to date. I also curated recently a show with my mom, who's a photographer, of photographs from Chiapas and the Zapatista uprising. And I really enjoyed that. Like I, like, I think my whole life I've worked on projects with my family. So it was, it was cool. It was a cool experience, like working with someone else's work, but designing the way the space looked. My perspective is, it, it um, not that it's problematic in like the context of being like a Mexican immigrant artist working in LA, but one of my earliest memories when that even was an issue was that I was told I couldn't participate in something that was Chicano because I wasn't born in the US. So they're like, you're not a Chicano artist, you're a Mexican artist, so you're like, you know, we can't include you. And I felt, to me, that just blew my mind. I was like, this is totally weird. Um, I don't like in my work leaning on like some of the things that people may identify as like, oh, that's Mexican art, that's Mexican American art. Like recently I did a piece um, that just happened to have like a Virgen de Guadalupe in the background and someone pointed out, like I've never seen you like incorporate that kind of like iconography in your work. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't purposely like try to do that, you know? Uh, but I feel like also like it's just innate, like the way I see things is probably the vision of someone who emigrated as a kid to LA and was told like, hey, you're not this, you're not that. And just kind of figuring out the commonalities in that experience. And then uh, back to the aesthetic I was talking about, it's like, I feel like cities have like this, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like it's globalization, but it's, it's just all these commonalities that across the world that I see in cities. And I feel like that I, I identify that more like a like being a person in an urban like super chaotic environment rather than like I'm from Mexico you know what I mean yeah, yeah. even though Mexico has fed that like especially Mexico City has fed that like craziness and so has LA that's I think where that like separation I was talking about between like my graffiti work and like my practice and my design work my studio practice and my design work is that the Zapatista character started as a graphic design job so I was asked by the Zapatistas, being, having been involved in a lot of like organizing, a lo um, like in relation to that movement in LA, I was asked to design these characters for use by everyone that was doing solidarity work around the world. So I designed them for the Zapatistas, gave them those characters, and then the, the characters kind of split in a few different ways. Like one was me being asked to paint them on walls 
and I started painting them on walls here in LA. Another was the Zapatistas and people working with them, taking those characters and just like totally adopting them and changing them. Like there's Zapatista characters in Germany, there's Zapatista characters in, in Japan based on my characters, but also like adding or subtracting some of the iconography. And for me, like the direct um, like link is just that there are people in Chiapas like using like the, the, you know, the clothing they wear, the symbols they use to represent different facets of that organizing campaign that I designed them for. So there's like a musician, there's like an old woman, there's like an activist, there's like someone reading. So that's probably, I'd say like the overtly, I'd say it's overtly related to Zapatistas and to maybe like some of the communities in Chiapas, but then that's also like, some not a common thing across Mexico, you know? And then politically also like, there's like all these different, you know, like different waves where like, like the Zapatistas themselves aren't necessarily like included in other like leftist or progressive causes like in the Northern Mexico or, you know, in what, in occupied Mexico or Southern California or that type of thing. So they they are very specific. So I don't know if people would recognize them as like, oh, those are necessarily just Mexican icons. So back, so that was also where like collaborating with my parents like really came in. And I, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm super fortunate I've been able to have that experience because my parents in the 80s started a community DIY space in what is called Pico Union. And the concept of that space was to showcase arts from immigrant communities in LA and naturally being the Pico Union community, we had arts from Latin America mainly. Uh, that was one of the places where the whole like Chicano, like Latin American immigrant thing kind of like collided for me because it was like, oh, you guys don't show Chicano artists. And we're like, well, you know, like we do, if you live in this neighborhood, like we'll show you what, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then that kind of started to work out where like, like people started to understand that Macondo, which was the name of the space, was designed for community art. So like anyone can come and, you know, suggest like something or like propose to having some like, you know, an event or an exhibit or a film screening. So fast forward to high school where a couple of my friends in high school were really into hardcore. And we were, I was into hardcore, but never like actively involved in it. And one of our friends was like, why don't we do shows at your space? And so I proposed that as like, the youth branch of our programming and we started from there we just we also really did not know what we were doing we we're just like let's call up these bands and see if they play and it started to work and it started to like really become a place that was inclusive of all kinds of forms of expression you know so this is this might be a little newer but I don't think, and a lot of people outside of uh, LA know, like there's like a miniature uh, version of the, the Alhambra, like down the street. It's like a, the arch, that's like a tiny one. And like people are like, what is that? Like no one, like it's really not a, a connection people make. You know, this place, this neighborhood's called Alhambra. Like there's like a little miniature version of it. Um, I think that's pretty obscure, yeah. From the way I see it, Soul Assassins is sort of like an umbrella, like a, it's almost like in terms that like I'm more familiar with, it's more like a crew where like you're part of that crew, whether you do music or whether, whether you do music or whether you do design or whether you're a photographer, or you're into cars or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But Soul, SA, Soul Assassins Studios um, got formed as a creative agency and Mr. Cartoon and Esteban Oriol were the like creative directors of the agency. Uh, they're like, you know, they're, I would say, crew with Cypress Hill, Be Real, um, <coughs> that whole like extended family. Uh, so naturally a lot of the, the SA studio work was like sort of like LA urban culture, hip hop, like, like sort of like East Side, like 
what I used to call cholo. I think some. I think people still kind of know it as cholo, but it's like more extended. It's like car culture, like low low rider bikes, that kind of thing. So the clients that SA Studios would get would be looking for that kind of aesthetic. Um, I got brought on through Patrick Martinez, who was art directing for them as well. He was art directing under like uh, Esteban and Mr. Cartoon, and so they were always looking for like Latino or like you know artists that like kind of have worked in in those worlds. And we started. I'm trying to remember what my first job with them was. We start, well, one of the main things we did was curate spaces. So it would be like experiences that we kind of design. And it, it was obviously, it was always like for some kind of product. Like one of the bigger ones we did was for Star Wars. So Patrick and I art directed this space to give it sort of like an, a bodega look, but we don't really have bodegas in LA. So that was one of the first things we were like, hey, like we have liquor stores, we're not bodegas. So we kind of changed it to sort of fit that aesthetic. Um, as part of like both of us being involved in the art world, we like curated an art exhibit that was themed to that. Um, so we did a lot of projects that were similar where it was like, you know, design a space, uh, get a selection of artists, curate, and provide like just a marketing experience for whatever, for Star Wars, for video games, that kind of thing. Uh, I also worked on a magazine that was affiliated with them called Rhyme. It was a hip hop magazine. Like Pat was the art director and I did the graffiti pages and I would write about it for that. So yeah. And just a kind of obscure thing. I don't know if it, it should be super public, but <laughs> my neighbor has recorded a few tracks for the the upcoming, or maybe it came out, Cypress Hill record. Oh. Yeah, and then Andrew from Strife, that was, whose band played uh, in Fullerton, like he's done a lot of recording with B, um, not with Be Real, I don't remember. Mugs? But Mugs, yeah, and they had a band together. Oh, really? Yeah, called uh, Cross My Heart, Hope to Die. Hmm. So it was Andrew Mugs, uh, this guy Sean Bonner, you might know him, he, he was doing like the radiation testing in Tokyo after Fukushima. Uh, okay. Yeah, he art directed for like Victory Records or something. Oh. So it's like this weird connection, but yeah, like so Mugs is, is Soul Assassins and like they recorded like in my neighbor's studio and they recorded with Andrew.